seen it. It was so key to me that it was into music. He was the music. I remember at the moment it was something like that there was no click.
guess this is, I, I feel that they were a special family, that they can somehow get a connection, even though he had very limited ability to connect to anyone, but they can still somehow find him in there, that they can find his personality and the little things he does and the little sighs he makes. Did you notice the sound while you were recording, or did you notice that afterwards?
Friday at 10 GMT. Elton and Hour, I look with Jewel Fitchin. Meet our final 2020 BBC Inspirations winners. A young Mexican woman whose ex tried to shame her with revenge porn and who fought back in the most courageous and facial changing way. And a man hoping to save the Bakitan from extinction. The newsroom is next for the BBC World Service, the world's radio station.
suspected islamist militants have attacked two villages in northeast mozambique with reports that dozens of civilians were kidnapped monjane and olombe villages are close to the construction site of a gas project for the multinational firm total earlier this month total suspended work following another islamist militant attack a series of aftershocks has caused additional damage in croatia following the country's strongest earthquake in decades at least seven people were killed by the 6.2 magnitude quake on Tuesday. Guy Delaunay reports. The strongest aftershock hit just after six in the morning, a rude awakening for emergency workers trying to snatch some rest. The Croatian Mountain Rescue Service have been using dogs to search for survivors throughout the night in the town of Petrinja and surrounding villages. They found people sleeping in their cars, unwilling to go too far from their damaged homes, but afraid to return. Many others spend the night in dormitories and other temporary facilities. The European Union has promised to help, and its Commissioner for Crisis Management will personally assess the situation in Petrinja. Iran says it will pay $150,000 to the families of each of the passengers who died when it accidentally shot down a Ukrainian airliner. The plane was mistakenly downed by an air defense unit as it took off from Tehran nearly a year ago. A landslide in a snow-laden Norwegian valley has left several people trapped under the collapsed roofs of their houses. Aerial footage showed a slick of mud covering the homes furthest up the slope in Yerdrum, northeast of the capital, Oslo. At least nine people were injured. That's the latest BBC News. Thanks. You're listening to the newsroom. Me, Nick Miles. This is the BBC World Service. Uh, in a moment, we are going to be looking at this new vaccine that has been approved by the British authorities. It could be a game changer. It's a lot cheaper, a lot easier to store than the other vaccines that are available uh, medical correspondent in a moment. But within the past hour, the British Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, has been urging MPs to back his hard-won free trade deal with the European Union, ahead of a crucial climate trade Here is Mr Johnson speaking. Just as we've avoided trade barriers, so we've also ensured the UK's full control of our laws and our regulations. And there is a vital symmetry between these two achievements, because the central purpose of this bill is to accomplish something that the British people always knew in their hearts could be done, and yet which we were continually told was impossible. We were told we could not have our cake and eat it. Do you remember how often we were told that, uh, Mr Speaker? Namely, that we could trade and cooperate uh, as we will, with our European neighbours on the closest terms of friendship and goodwill while retaining sovereign control of our laws and our national destiny. Well, earlier this deal was signed by the European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen and the European Council President Charles Michel before being flown to London for Mr Johnson's signature and I'm joined by a political correspondent Rob Watson. Rob, you were listening to that parliamentary debate in Westminster. Mr Johnson was pretty bullish. How was he trying to sell this deal to MPs? I think the first thing to say, Nick, is that uh, this bill will definitely go through. There's absolutely no doubts about that. Hugely important. Uh, he was bullish, and, and I think in the short term, things do look rather good for, for Mr Johnson. He sort of quelled any dissent in his party, and the opposition party were also getting behind the deal. And how did he sell it? I think he came up with what would be called the broad sweep of history defence, which is, look, Britain has always had this complex relationship with continental Europe. We're not seeking a rupture, we're seeking a resolution, and that resolution is that we will become uh, best friends and allies, uh, and we will trade with the European Union. Now, of course, critics would say, well, did it really need any resolution, and is this deal, and is Brexit the correct resolution, if uh, there was a problem indeed in the first place? Now, he was saying, sounded quite Churchill, Churchill's, Churchill's um, biography, of course, um, but he was saying that this is not an end, but a beginning. The road forward is going to be quite bumpy, a lot of things aren't resolved. Yes, that's absolutely right. So f this covers trade, and trade will be more complicated. There'll be lots of paperwork, lots of regulatory checks, and it doesn't cover the biggest area of the British economy properly, which is services. The one thing that Britain is really good at is selling financial services, insurance, so things like if you're an architect or you're a bank, your qualification patients won't necessarily count in Europe. So all of that will be the subject of discussion, and I think that gets to the, to the question if we're talking about the international dimension. I mean, will Britain indeed and the European Union become best friends and allies or will they be rather more awkward neighbours with lots of friction about trade? Uh, and looking ahead to the European Union's position on this, uh, they're not going to make things 
things easy in the uh, weeks and months ahead, uh, it's going to be very difficult to, to carry on as Mr Johnson was, saying that businesses in the UK are going to have more trade companies than in the future. How will that work? Uh, well, I think he, he didn't explain that, and lots of businesses will be uh, immensely sceptical. But I think actually that the bigger issue that was raised in the debate, and it was raised by the leader of the, of the main opposition Labour Party, Sir Keir Starmer, is that if Brexit was all about sovereignty and getting back Britain's right to diverge from the European Union rules and regulations, will it? And what exactly is Mr Johnson's vision? What does global Britain mean? And will it stick closely to EU standards? Or won't it? Because at this point, the government has had lots of slogans about global Britain, but what it really means, how the UK will make its way in the world, and whether it will continue to be as closely interconnected with, with Europe as it is economically at the moment, we simply don't know. Rob Watson, thanks for that. In China, a court in Shenzhen has sentenced 10 Hong Kong activists to between seven months and three years for an illegal border crossing when they tried to flee Hong Kong. Both. The trial has mostly been in secret and it's been criticised by some members of the international community. The US, for example, said that the only supposed crime the group had committed was to try to flee tyranny. Our correspondent Stephen McDonnell, who's in Beijing, gave us the background to the case. So there were 12 activists in Hong Kong, all facing charges related to their supposed activities during those protests, the year of upheaval in Hong Kong in 2019. Fearing they were going to face harsh punishment because of this protest activity, they attempted to flee Hong Kong by a speedboat. They wanted to reach Taiwan and seek sanctuary there, but the Chinese Coast Guard grabbed them and they've been held in mainland China since then and today faced trial behind closed doors. Now, 10 of them received prison sentences and two minors were sent back to Hong Kong already. The two people who organised this, or said to have organised it, received the harshest punishment. One, four years in prison, the other three is in prison, and the remaining eight will serve out seven months in prison in mainland China before all being sent back to Hong Kong, where they will eventually face those original charges anyway. That was Stephen McDonald. The path out of this coronavirus pandemic is a very bumpy one indeed. Over the last few weeks, vaccines by BioNTech and Moderna were approved for use. But then cases soared again because of new, more infectious strains of the virus occurring here in Britain and South Africa. Now, though, a fresh piece of good news. A British medical regulator has approved the coronavirus vaccine developed by Oxford University and AstraZeneca for emergency use. The UK's Health Secretary, Matt Hancock, told the BBC he now has a very high degree of confidence that Britain can be out of the pandemic by the spring. Not only have we now got two vaccines and the NHS delivery plan to be able to get it out to, to everybody, and we've got 100 million of these on order, um, but it also, this vaccine means that we can accelerate that delivery plan so we can bring this pandemic to an end faster than we previously would have been able to. You know, the vaccine is our way out of this. Well, the key thing about this vaccine is that it's cheaper than the alternatives and it can also be stored at the temperature of a standard fridge, 4 degrees Celsius. Well, the chief executive of AstraZeneca, Pascal Soriol, said this new vaccine has another distinct advantage. The dosage regimen is one dose followed by a second dose one to three months later. And the good news with this is that we're going to be able to inject a lot of people with one dose very quickly, provide them with a reasonable, good level of protection until they get the second dose later, two to three months later. And that enables us to protect many more people because we can wait two to three months for the second dose. Well, Smitha Mundasad is our health correspondent. Um, Smitha, he talked about effectiveness. How effective is it? As you heard, the UK is considering doing one dose, waiting around three months to give the second dose, and the chief executive of AstraZeneca said that first dose should provide reasonable and a good level of protection until the second dose gives better, fuller protection. The data we have suggests it's around 62% effective with those two doses. 
And in terms of variants, we are hearing sadly about new variants around the world. Well, the chief executive of AstraZeneca has spoken to the BBC today and said that he believes the vaccine should be effective against the variant that's been identified in the UK. And Oxford University is working to continue to test that. One of the key issues for all this is that it's great for a wealthy nation, but what about the poorer parts of the world? What does this particular vaccine offer mean for that? I think it's fair to say that many poorer parts of the world have been waiting for this vaccine because of some of the reasons you outlined previously. It can be stored at normal fridge temperatures for around six months, making it much easier to get it through to people compared to, say, the Pfizer vaccine that needs to be stored at minus 70 degrees. Now, uh, according to AstraZeneca, the vaccine will be provided on a not-for-profit basis worldwide for the duration of the pandemic and always at cost price to low and middle income countries. So some good news there. What about in terms of the number of doses? Uh, we're hearing that hundreds of millions of doses have been ordered by lots of different countries around the world. How quickly can this company, AstraZeneca, actually produce them? AstraZeneca has been pretty confident when asked today that it can produce doses very quickly, that it has production lines set up in, in different countries around the world. But in terms of when will other countries actually see this vaccine, uh, when will people in uh, more remote places get the vaccine, that is a much harder question. Of course, the green light given by the UK regulator today will be seen as a positive step and other countries will now start looking more closely and talking to their regulators to see if they can approve the vaccine. Uh, but we will have to wait and see when exactly it will come through. I think there are high hopes that it won't be very long. So that, many thanks for that. And for all the latest news on the pandemic, including developments in vaccines and testing, just search for our five-minute coronavirus global update podcast, which this team actually produces. You are listening to the BBC World Service. Daniel, what's your name? Britain says it hopes to inoculate millions of people against coronavirus in the coming months after regulators approved the Oxford University AstraZeneca vaccine. Prime Minister Boris Johnson has urged Parliament to back his post-Brexit deal with the European Union, saying it will open a new chapter in the national story. And the Argentine Senate has voted to legalise abortion to the delight of women's rights campaigners. And that is the country's Vice President, Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner, announcing the result of that hugely significant vote in the Senate. Abortions up to the 14th week have just been legalised. That was the reaction outside the Senate building where thousands of flag-waving pro-abortion activists had gathered late into the night at 4 a.m. that decision came through. Until now, terminations were only allowed in cases of rape or when the mother's health was at risk. South and Central America have got some of the most restricted abortion laws in the whole world. I asked our South America correspondent Katie Watson how divisive though, this issue is in Argentina. Argentina has a, a powerful Catholic church, the Pope himself is, is Argentinian and there's also a, a powerful evangelical church and those elements will very, you know, put up a strong fight against this bill. In fact, you know, Pope Francis even commented on Twitter or made allusions to the vote without actually being too explicit on the day. But despite that, Argentina has also had a very mighty women's movement that has really pushed for this. So just over two years ago, we were in practically the same position where the Senate narrowly voted against the bill. This time around, President Fernandez had backed the bill himself. In fact, it had been part of a campaign promise of his, and that, for many people, was thought to be the difference this time, that the fact that there was presidential backing pushed the bill through eventually and it's been a, a bill that's been in place since 1921 from campaigners for years and years have fought to change this so this has been um, you know seen on the streets the, the kind of jubilation because um, of this bill that's finally come around in a region that's incredibly restrictive for reproductive rights. Absolutely uh, but specifically looking at Argentina still Katie uh, remind us of the practical implications of this on the health of many women. 
Well, Fernandez, the president himself, talked about the fact that around 40,000 women are hospitalized every year because of illegal abortions. And that was the, with the pro-choice campaigners, the argument wasn't, that they made sure that the argument wasn't put in a kind of pro, a for or against issue. It was actually the fact that women will access illegal abortions no matter what. And the most important thing was that those women were able to access safe abortions. Because it also comes down to inequality in a country that is deeply unequal. You know, wealthier women could fly to different countries, fly to the US, for example, and, and access abortions there. And it was the poorer women who were left accessing unsafe backstreet abortions, that sort of thing. Katie, do you think this is going to have a big impact on other countries in the region, or, or do they make decisions individually? No, I think this will have a, a huge impact, certainly in Brazil, in Chile, where there are activists that are really campaigning. They will be looking at Argentina as an example, and certainly you know, it's, the, it's the, the biggest country, the, the largest country so far in Latin America to legalize abortion. So, you know, the likes of Brazil and Chile are certainly watching this, you know, carefully to see whether perhaps that can influence their own politicians to change the law. Of course, in areas such as Central America, where there are sort of some of the you know, toughest restrictions still remain, that might be a, an even bigger challenge. But I think this will help pave the way, if you like, for change in the region. And that was Katie Watson. Now let's go back to our top story now. The coronavirus pandemic, this new vaccine from AstraZeneca, has brought a lot of hope that an end could be in sight. But with lockdowns around the world in many parts of many countries, it could come too late for the thousands of businesses and millions of jobs at risk. Some cities like New York have been particularly badly hit. The BBC's Nick Bryant sent this report from the Big Apple about how people there are coping economically and psychologically. Christmas 2020, where the carols sound more like the mess. This was a trumpeter on Fifth Avenue, a street normally packed with tourists and shoppers that was virtually empty of foot traffic. New York is festooned with many of the usual decorations. The Christmas tree at the Rockefeller Center looks as pretty as ever. But these holiday traditions come with the new protocols of the pandemic. Strict rules governing social distancing at a time when people normally congregate together. The last time I was here was with my dad. No. The fun fair at Coney Island on New York's Atlantic shoreline always brings back memories for Angelina Pruya. Of her father Richard, a keen long distance runner who died from the coronavirus at the beginning of the outbreak. He was just 66 years old. I feel like I've lost more than just my dad. I've lost a feeling of safety, a feeling of confidence uh, in my living situation, in my government, um, in my fellow citizens. Um, the half of the people I encounter ask me um, what pre-existing condition my father had, which was none, by the way. He was 66 and healthy. So it just feels like um, we're all alone. Christmas must be a particularly tough time. Um, I think I was in a state of like shock and denial the first couple of months. Um, and I was functioning a lot better, but as the holidays have started to roll around, um, it's really dawned on me. Oh, how many memories are going to go unmade? It is so unnecessary. We've been doing this now for nine months straight. Then there's the economic toll of this crisis. Pre-COVID, this food bank served 200 people a week. <laughs> On this morning, it provided vital assistance to 200 people in the first 10 minutes. For just as poverty has been a propagator of the pandemic, 
the pandemic has become a propagator of poverty. Good morning, everyone. Please have your bags open and ready. Thank you. Father Mike Lopez is a veteran of previous disasters, but the COVID crisis is of a different magnitude altogether. These queues are as long now as they were in March. It's, it's extraordinary to say. Yeah, they keep getting longer and longer. The lines and the need keeps growing and growing. Uh, and it's harder for us as an organization to keep up with the need and the demand right now. For all the festive trappings of the holiday season, it's been a terrible 2020, not just for New York City, but for America as a whole. COVID has exposed so many of this country's long-term ailments, the rundown of its government, its racial and income disparities, the decline of reason, the politicization of everything, even something as simple as a face mask. 2020, the year of the pandemic, and one that people here can't wait to consign to the past. That was Nick Bryant reporting. And here is Danielle with some of you in the stories we've been here today. Chinese researchers say almost 5% of the people in the Chinese city of Wuhan may have been infected with COVID-19. Wuhan's population is estimated at 11 million, which suggests that almost 500,000 people may have had the virus. If the figures from the Chinese Center for Disease Control and Prevention are accurate, that is almost 10 times higher than Wuhan's officially recorded number of just over 50,000 cases. Russian state investigators have opened another criminal case against the opposition leader Alexei Navalny. Russia's investigative committee has accused Mr. Navalny and others of large-scale fraud. It alleges they've spent nearly $5 million donated to organizations he controls for his personal use. Mr. Navalny is recovering in Germany after being poisoned in August with a Novichok toxin. And the director, Steven Soderbergh, says he's developing a sequel to his pandemic thriller Contagion, which has found new popularity amid the coronavirus outbreak. The 2011 film surged up the charts after people were first ordered to stay at home earlier this year. Thanks, Danielle. Uh, this year has been full of cancelled flights and ruined travel plans thanks to the pandemic. Uh, we're all looking forward to the day when we can take a holiday without worrying about our health. But there's one group of frequent flyers in the US that won't be boarding a plane anytime soon. Peter Goffin is here to explain. Peter. Yeah, Nick, we are talking about emotional support animals. Now, these are dogs or cats or maybe something a little more exotic that help people cope with mental and emotional problems from anxiety to depression to post-traumatic stress disorder. And because they're often seen as service animals, like guide dogs for the blind, they've sometimes been allowed to sit out in the open on airplanes on their owner's laps or by their feet. But Alaska Airlines in the U.S. has said it's clamping down and from next month only dogs who are specially trained to help people with a disability will be considered a service animal. And that could still be a therapy dog for mental health issues. And this is just the first airline to take advantage of a ruling by the U.S. government this month that gives airlines the right to classify support animals except for dogs as pets rather than service animals. So they've specified that dogs are okay. Presumably there was a reason. Was it getting out of hand with the number of animals? It, it was. It was a veritable Noah's Ark worth of animals boarding flights over the past few years, Nick. We've seen monkeys, ducks, turkeys, even kangaroos on people's seats. Last year, U.S. officials said the three most common support animals were dogs, cats, and you probably guessed this already, but miniature horses. Of course. Of course. And it looks like it's been, uh, and look, sorry, we have to say, it's been proven that being around animals and stroking them and talking to them will reduce anxiety. And advocates have said that clamping down on support animals is a blow to disability rights. But the airlines have said this rotating menagerie of support animals has caused damage to planes and post pose health and safety risks two passengers and crew alike. Now, one of the more notorious cases was a U.S. Airways flight. In 2014, a woman turned up with her pot-bellied pig that weighed 36 kilograms, and before the plane even took off, the pig had relieved itself in the aisles. As the woman tried to clean up the mess, the pig got loose and started running around the plane squealing. Ultimately, both the pig and the woman were asked to leave. I wonder whether or not uh, they'd allow stick insects. They're a good predictor of turbulence. Uh, that's what I think. Is that right? Well, they're nice and quiet. You? I think they're nice and quiet and they wouldn't get in the way. <laughs> okay, Peter, many thanks for that. Before we go, our main news headline is that Britain says it hopes to inoculate millions of people against coronavirus in the coming months. That's it. Thanks for your time. Bye-bye.
You're listening to the BBC World Service and the sights and sounds of Bulgaria. Art is a place, no matter of what political, ideological beliefs, no matter what our sexual preferences, we can have amazing experience together. Until 1989, Bulgaria was a communist-controlled state. In the last 30 years, the country and its art scene has undergone a cultural transformation. The state would like to present one identity, my task to tell these unknown hidden stories. I'm Tracy Harris and I'm meeting three extraordinary Bulgarian artists to uncover how their experimental art reflects modern day Bulgaria and the country's difficult past. I wanted to try and overlay these two spaces of Bulgarian history and to sort of examine it by putting myself in it. Bulgaria's Art on the Edge, Saturday at 5.30 GMT. I'm Gareth Mitchell with Technology This Half Hour here on the BBC World Service. Today we're looking back on the digital year that just was and 2020 has brought us contact tracing apps, funerals streamed via video conferencing apps and also an outbreak of internet shutdowns around the world. Our band of regular experts will be giving their assessments and we usually have them on separately so this is a rare opportunity to bring us all together. You can listen to the conversation on Digital Planet coming up after the news. BBC News with Danielle Jawowiecka. Britain has become the first country to approve the coronavirus vaccine developed by Oxford University and AstraZeneca for emergency use. It is much cheaper than those developed by BioNTech and Moderna and can be stored in conventional fridges. AstraZeneca has said it will be available at cost price in perpetuity to low and middle income countries. The British Prime Minister Boris Johnson has urged Parliament to back his post-Brexit deal at the start of a debate that's expected to secure approval within a day. He said the agreement should allow businesses to do even more trade with the European Union. The EU's leaders in Brussels have already signed the deal. The Argentine Senate has voted to legalise abortion up to the 14th week of pregnancy. Women's rights campaigners gathered outside the Congress erupted in jubilation when their victory became clear. Suspected Islamist militants have attacked two villages in northeast Mozambique with reports that dozens of civilians were kidnapped. Monjane and Olumbe villages are close to the site of a gas project for the multinational firm Total. Explosions have rocked the airport that serves the Yemeni city of Aden soon after a plane carrying the country's new government landed. A French news agency correspondent at the scene said the blasts detonated as the cabinet ministers were leaving the aircraft. There were no immediate reports that any of them were hurt. A landslide in a snow-laden Norwegian valley has left several people trapped under the collapsed roofs of their houses. Police said some had managed to phone relatives pleading for help. Aerial footage showed a slick of mud covering homes in Yerdrum, northeast of Oslo. A former US Navy analyst who spent 30 years in jail for spying for Israel has flown to Tel Aviv and been welcomed on the tarmac by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Jonathan Pollard was given Israeli citizenship while serving his jail term. That's the latest BBC News. Hello, I'm Gareth Mitchell and this is Digital Planet. Today, welcome to a special edition as the entire programme team comes together to ask what on earth just happened? Or to put it more formally, actually, to look back on 2020. What were the digital issues and the stories that really stood out for us? So in alphabetical order, just to keep it nice and fair, let's say hi to each of our regular studio experts on this rare occasion where they're all together. This is lovely. So let's start with you, Ghislaine Boddington. I'm going to put you on the spot here and ask each of you just what was your word or maybe your phrase of 2020? What about you, Ghislaine? Well, I've been working with remote connected communication systems for many years. So for me, virtual presence is the phrase that I pull out from 2020 as a massive shift in our understanding of what liveness is, that now our physical presence is extended into our virtual presence through all this Zooming and video conferencing that we're doing from our homes, from everywhere, but it's still live. Mm. So an understanding of that virtual and physical liveness coming together. So virtual presence oh, is my phrase of the year. That is lovely. All right. How about you, Angelica Mari, technology journalist, joining us from Sao Paulo in Brazil. What's your word or phrase of 2020? I have two, Gareth. So inclusive innovation. So 
it is no longer a nice to have in the development of new technology, but essential to survive. And on a less serious note, I would say, este não é meu fundo de tela, which is in Brazilian Portuguese translates to, this is not actually my background. So people putting up desert beaches and pubs and stuff to hide their messy bedrooms. Oh yes, on the video <laughs> conferencing, oh, we've all had fun with backgrounds, haven't we? That is, that you've just defined 2020 right there, Angelica. <laughs> I, God, I don't know if Bill Thompson can match that.